Good morning. My sincere thanks to all of you for coming today. I appreciate as well that this is taking time out of your classroom. And yet, and yet here we are in the home of the Silicon Valley. We're in this place where we led the economic development of the 20th and the 21st century. And one of the most important things that caused that to happen was we were committed to educating our children. When I graduated from high school, back when the buffalo roamed the plains, we were fifth of the 50 states in per pupil spending. And we had built nine out of the 10 campuses of the University of California, all but two of the state universities, all but two of the main campuses of the community college. Indeed, and in fact, California was the, the beacon for the country. By the way, at that time, we didn't have the poorest children, the largest number, and the largest percentage of poor children nor do I think we had the largest number and the largest percentage of English learners. And yet we were invested in kids' education. Those people came out of a depression and a war, because I am old. But along life's roadway, I've had some wonderful opportunities to work with people who were interested in this topic of how we can advance the future of our education, how we can make California again on the leading edge and the cutting edge of what we need to know. And I want to give a shout out first to Barbara. You know, there were times when people made fun of me. Pete Wilson actually said when I proposed class size reduction in K3, I was throwing money at a problem. He now cites it as one of his great accomplishments. <laughs> but as someone once said, there's no end to what we could do if we didn't care who got credit for it. I did have to sue him to get the money, but you know. <laughs> Nonetheless, and all the more, I want to give a shout out to Barbara Nemco, who has always been a county superintendent who worked to bring her districts together to work together, and who was the first county superintendent to commit to technology for her preschoolers by bringing school to brilliance to preschools in Napa County. And the, and the program, the computerized program, is not only in English, but it's in Spanish and it's going well. Barbara, thank you for always being on the leading edge and the cutting edge. I've got some other great friends who've helped educate me over the years. I want to give a shout out to John and Ruth Mary Cradler, who have really been very important and who helped put me in touch with Mike Lawrence so that I could be here today. Ray Chavez, who's your board president. I really do believe that um, these jobs, these board jobs are not glamorous. I know I serve on a bunch of boards and they do you know, take you all over the place and yet and yet and yet you're here today. This place is full because you have a great board. And I just want to say to all of you that um, it is true that 20 years ago I hosted the first net day in California. At that time, I'm sorry, but the governor, Wilson, essentially said, what are you going to get, 500 people out to help you? Well, we got over 30,000 out to help us. And we did get a president, a vice president, and the whole cabinet. They were all over the state, and yet I was in, I started in Concord with uh, George Miller, who was chair of education, and with President Clinton and President Gore, Vice President Gore. And Vice President Gore said to me, you know, Delane, if California, the home of the Silicon Valley, isn't wired, then neither is Mississippi or Montana or Maine. Neither is neither's the rest of the, any other state in any part of the country. If we need to wire California, then we need to wire every place. And he went back to Washington, D.C. and proposed the E-rate. And he said California should take full credit for the fact that there is an E-rate because he was inspired that day. The truth is we had a lot of wonderful people who showed up. And a lot of them are, uh, probably a few of them are here. Any, we got any net day survivors? Yeah, we got some net day survivors. Great. And as well, we also have a lot of wonderful people who realized that this was, the, was, in fact, what we had to do to end the digital divide. Lots of people have helped. You have some great sponsors here. I want to give them a shout out. California Emerging Technology Fund, who's really worked hard to create some wonderful models. I want to give them a shout out. But I want to just remind everybody how much has happened in your lifetimes, even the youngest pole cats in this room. A lot has happened. It happens pretty fast. Last summer, I went home to the family reunion. We still own the family farm on Sheep Creek. In case you're wondering where Sheep Creek is, it's a tributary of Wolf Creek, not far from Hogsjaw in Kentucky. 
That's in Whitley County, home of the University of the Cumberlands, but, and I've had a number of family members who actually attended that school. But I heard a story I'd never heard before. The story was that my Aunt Edith, who had an AA degree, and that qualified her to teach school in 19, late 30s and early 40s, my Aunt Edith was teaching at the Sheep Creek Schoolhouse. It was a first through eighth grade school, and in fact, it was uh, about a mile from the farm. My aunt and uncle and their two children, John, Paul, and Barbara, were uh, living with my grandparents, and the last of the two, the last two kids that were living at home, that would be Uncle Chris and Aunt June, the twelfth and thirteenth of the thirteen children, and they were all living on the farm because it was the Great Depression. So Aunt Edith every day would get up and take John Paul with her to school, and they went over to, over to the Sheep Creek School, and she taught all these grades, and then she came home, and then Pearl Harbor happened. Well, my dad was in the Navy. He joined in 1931. He was actually accepted at Eastern Kentucky University, but the house burned down. My grandfather cut a load of logs for the Hiram Wolf Mountain Tie Company and was never paid, and he went bankrupt. He lost the sawmill. So my dad heard they were gonna recruit for the military and went down and signed up and a bunch of people stood in line and they only took one recruit from Williamsburg, Kentucky. And that was my dad, he joined the Navy. He went all over the world. 1939, he went to China. He was on the gunboat, the USS Tutuila, for those of you who saw the sand pebbles from Steve McQueen years ago. He was on the Tutuila and he sent, you know, wrote home a lot. I've seen some of the letters that didn't burn up in the fire. But the truth is, the house burned down twice, once in 31 and once in 43. The truth is that my dad decided he needed to send home a battery, a big battery and a battery powered radio because there was no electricity on the farm. And they were doing rural electrification but they hadn't gotten to Sheep Creek. I don't think they were even at Hog's Jaw yet. <laughs> and so in fact, my dad sent home this radio and Pearl Harbor happened. And Aunt Edith said, oh, she heard that the President of the United States was going to give a speech. You've heard this speech, many of you. December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. And so, in fact, Edith marched those kids, all, the entire school, over a mile from the Sheep Creek Schoolhouse to my parents' farmhouse, my grandparents' farmhouse, so they could hear that speech. For the rest of their lives, when they went back to Sheep Creek, went back to Williamsburg, somebody would come up and say, you don't know me, but I was in school with you, and I was there the day your mom took us over to hear the radio. For many of those children, it was the first time they'd ever heard a radio, because there was no electricity in that part of Kentucky. And so, in fact, I remember my grandfather bought the first television on the block in, in Shawnee Avenue in San Francisco. And I came home one day and all the neighbors were sitting in chairs, watching the test pattern, waiting for the TV to come on. <laughs> so much has changed, and, and, it, and the speed is picking up, and yet California's pace is not picking up. The truth is, we have to make sure that in fact, we have much more access for all of our children to celebrate, yes, our successes because we have connectivity between and among our students and our teachers, and in some cases, wonderful administrators who engage. But we've got to make sure that every leader in every school district, including every board, understands that this is as important as having electricity in the school. This is absolutely vital to our future. The information age is here. And we have to be clear that teachers need to integrate a blended learning model with technology. We've got to get out of our silos. We've got to stop teaching in narrow little subject areas. And we've got to help these kids to learn across the curriculum. So John Cradler recently said to me that one of the concerns he has is that we've decided to do the local control funding formula and send all the money back to the locals. But you know, maybe there is some room for some direction from Sacramento that we've got to make sure that we're training all of our teachers to use this technology and to work together in groups and to teach their kids to work together in groups.
There has to be a commitment made to professional development. It's so important you're here today, but we must find ways that what you learn today and tomorrow, you can take home and share with your colleagues. We've got to do a better job, in fact, of making sure that when we talk about the Common Core, we have to use technology to drive home the deeper meaning of what these standards are about. They're not isolated facts. They're lear learning to use information. And in a world where information doubles every couple of years, we can't afford to just memorize some things and find the right answer from a s number of, of different questions. Look, I'm not against assessment. You know, in the private sector, they say what gets measured is what gets done. We're going to have some assessment. But my dad used to also say you don't fatten a hog by weighing it more often. <laughs> and so, the assessment has to be authentic, and it has to be real, and it has to be used as a, as a way of helping kids to learn across the curriculum. A number of schools celebrate greater engagement of their students and themselves, and this becomes a eureka moment, because there are kids that are like, yeah, nah, until they, you introduce them to these technical wonder, wonders that are happening in front of every computer. And it becomes even more important that we use it as a source of parent outreach. That's why I like CETF, because it's working not just to wire and, and connect California Emerging Technology Fund, not to just wire and connect schools, but to get broadband into homes, into families, especially families who are learning English. We have got to have a commitment that we do go from school to home and from home to school with this information. We have to do a better job of making certain that there are computer science classes that are a domain for the boys and the girls. And I want to thank you for the uh, attention to that at this conference. Tom Adams, who works at the California Department of Education and used to work for me and lives across the street from me, brought me the latest numbers from CDE on the enrollment. And the reality is that the gap has started to increase between male and female enrollment again. We've got to stop that. The girls and the boys both have to learn to use technology. Moreover, we're in really treacherous waters in 2015 in California. The truth is we were tied with New York in per pupil spending when I graduated from high school, yes, back in 1965. We were tied with New York. We were fifth of the 50 states. To hear the people in Sacramento patting themselves on the back, you'd think we were there again, wouldn't you? Well, guess where we are? We've gone from 50th to 46th. Whoopee. <laughs> the reality is that New York spends twice per child what California is spending. So does New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Wyoming, Alaska, Maine, Massachusetts. The truth is California is spending 70% of the national average on per pupil spending. But this is a low cost state, right? Yeah. Housing prices are only 150% of the national average, and rents are 50% higher in California than they are anywhere else. In a high-cost state, you should be spending more on education, not less. It is disgraceful what has happened in Sacramento. Moreover, we've got to make sure we engage and involve the people at every work site, including every school site. It isn't a top-down approach that we need. You know, there's a wonderful guy named Donald Peterson who took over Ford Motor Company at that time in the 70s when everything seemed to be going to hell in American business. Donald Peterson called his engineers together and said, show me next year's cars. And so they brought the cars, designs that they were going to sell the next year. Boring. Donald Peterson said to his engineers, so tell me, is this the car you want to drive? And everybody kind of looked down and... Nobody said much, and finally one brave engineer, Jack Telnack, looked up and said, no, sir, that is not the car I want to drive. And Donald Peterson said, good, then go and design for me the car you want to drive. And that year, the Ford engineers came up with a little car called the Taurus, which became the best-selling car in America for over a decade, because he asked the people that did the work, what do we need to do? And there needs to be a lot more of that collaboration going on. Later, by the way, when Peterson was named Fortune Magazine's Corporate Leader of the Year, he said, I feel guilty receiving this. You know, when you see a turtle on a fence post, 
You know, it didn't get there by itself. <laughs> so the truth is we need wonderful new leaders in our schools, and the reality is that we have to make sure that those leaders engage and involve the people in, that work with them in the school. There's a <clears throat> fact of the matter is that what happened in the 70s in American business was really that the leadership began to engage more with the people with, who did the work. So the first message of leadership is none of us is as smart as all of us. There is an American myth that the triumphant individual is the secret to success. We tend to, com to in confuse leadership with heroism, but real leaders are not individual phenomenons. Real leadership and sustainable change is about growing cooperation and collaboration, and that's why you're here today. Not just to learn for yourselves, but to take home and share with your colleagues and the other people at your school site. I want to read you a uh, quote from Benison Biederman, who have a wonderful book called Organizing Genius. He says, quote, we have to recognize a new paradigm. Not great leaders alone, but great leaders who exist in a fertile relationship with a great group. To these creative alliances, the leader and the team are able to achieve something together that neither could achieve alone. The leader finds greatness in the group, and he or she helps their members to find themselves. That's why it's important that we have some administrators here and that we engage even more administrators in the future in this important work. Because greatness start, does start with great people, in a, in, but great groups and great leaders create each other. The command and control style really doesn't work, especially in this day and age. The leaders of successful organizations must act decisively, but not arbitrarily. That's why you have to create an atmosphere that empowers people. That, and that's why Q is important. That's why computer using educators being here talking to each other is important, and why you belong to Q. Is, and it's so important to our state and our future. Recently, KQED News published an article by Katrina Schwartz, who wrote about what education technology could look like over the next five years. She wrote about the importance of project-based learning as well as global cooperation and integrated learning. She used the example of Finland, one of the highest performing nations on earth. They moved away from traditional subjects in favor of more integrated learning. Competency-based learning is more important than time on task. And so, in fact, in this uh, report she notes, the four principles of integrated learning. Placing the learner at the center. Emphasizing interaction and doing. Working in groups and developing solutions to real world problems. That's what this is about, end quote, I should say. But we, so we need a strong leader, but he or she is more than the steward or a straw boss, more of a steward than a straw boss. We have to keep each other focused but minimize distractions, yes, but keep optimism alive. That's one of the things that worries me the most. If I go into a school and I find depressed people, I worry like crazy about what's gonna happen to those kids. Optimism is what we need. That's who we've been as a country. That's who you are. That's why you're educators. We've gotta help have optimism in our schools about the future of these kids. <clears throat> the other thing, thing that Benison Biederman said, the leaders of great groups love talent and know where to find it. Great groups are headed by people confident enough to recruit people better than themselves. They revel in the talents of others, and they also must be certain that these talented people can work together." End quote. So leaders who lead for sustainability must be believers in what they're doing. They must see their work as something close to holy. And, you know, reality is that this work is so important. Now, I will say we have some challenges ahead. The work is more difficult because of the poverty of our children. The work is more difficult because of the language challenges and the technology challenges that some of our poorest kids have. But the reality is that even though it is 
hard to foster collaborative learning approaches, even as we're trying to so personalize what we're doing in education. The reality is rethinking the role of teachers is hardest when there's a teacher shortage. So one of the things we have to do for this profession is make sure everybody understands that teaching is the most important job in America, period. Teachers are number one in terms of our success. And, and you know, it isn't just about, and I, I will say, and let me just make one point here. The state of California has a constitution. When you get sworn in to the legislature, or you get sworn in as a constitutional officer, or even as a school board member, you take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of California. Most people in the legislature don't seem to know what's in the Constitution of the state of California. So take a look, You're, especially any of you who are interested in public policy. Go to the Constitution and look up Article 16, Section 8. It says this, Quote, from all state revenues, there shall first be set apart the monies to be applied by the state for the support of the public school system and public institutions of higher education, end quote. There shall first be set aside monies for education. So I'm talking to one of the members of the legislature, I'm on the alumni board at UC Davis, or I was, I've just gotten off. I talked to this legislator, and he says, Delane, we, we gave a lot of money to schools. I said, we went from 50th to 46th in a very high-cost state with very poor children. That is not acceptable. He says, but Delane, you have to understand, we have to, you've been in the legislature, you, you have to understand we have to balance the, the police and the fire and the water and the roads, none of which are they doing a very good job at, I might add. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, but the Constitution says there shall first be set aside money for education. And he said, does it really say that? <laughs> so apparently there are a number of people in Sacramento who are not aware about the document they took an oath to, oath to uphold. But the, they used to know that. When I went there, they knew it. And we have to find a way to remind more people that the first job of the state of California is the education of children. Budgets are statements of values. If you remember nothing else I say today, remember that. Think of your own family budget. How do you spend your money? If you don't put your kids first, then shame on you. But I think you do. When the time came that I got accepted to UC Davis, and although my dad had some brothers and sisters that got to go to college, he didn't go, my mother didn't go, I was the first in the direct line to go. But when I got accepted at Davis, they needed a new car. They had a 10-year-old Studebaker. They, they wanted a... A uh, new couch, my brother and I had done our trampoline development on the old one, and there was a spring. My mother was mortified. My dad wanted to go to the family reunion in Kentucky because his mother had recently passed. Oh, and I got accepted at UC Davis. Did they buy a car? No couch, no trip to Kentucky. Even then, my dad had been on strike and they'd used most of their savings. My mother was nervous. She was trying to convince me to go to the community college. I went into my father in a very mature voice. I said, <laughs> and he said, well, let's go talk to your mother. And he said, Dottie, what's this about Delane not going to Davis? And she said, well, Hank, I don't see how we can afford it. Girls can't borrow money until they're 21. Boys can borrow at 18. It's true. They put women in the Civil Rights Act, and then they could borrow at 18. But by the time it took effect, I was 21. So for you youngins out there, I couldn't borrow the money. My parents had to borrow it, not at 4% and pay it back nine months after I graduated, they had to borrow at 7.5% and pay it back in three years. By the time I graduated from UC, well, by the time I was 21, I could take out the loans myself, my parents were paying twice their house payment on my student loans. Who would do that? Parents do that. But I will tell you that that education that they gave me was the best gift I ever got. It was life-changing for me. And the truth be known, budgets are statements of values. At that time, California was fifth in per-pupil spending. Tonight, we're 46th. Guess where we are in per-prisoner? Number one. Number one. So if budgets are statements of values, we apparently think prisons are more important than schools. And that is just wrong. And the fact is, we got too many people in jail because we didn't educate them. That's the reality. So 
something else I want to say to all of you, and that is that you do help them to develop their skills, and you do develop, help them to develop the ability to think and to solve problems and to work in groups. That's what you do. But there's a reality out there that we all have to acknowledge. Some of our kids come from dysfunctional families. Now, I want to just say, I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but I have had an epiphany in my life. I know now that if you're not from a dysfunctional family, you probably married someone from a dysfunctional family. <laughs> or your best friend was from a dysfunctional family. I'm a triple dipper. <laughs> and I can tell you that I grew up in an era where everybody pointed to the Ozzie and Harriet family. You know about Ozzie and Harriet? Ozzie was mad as a March hare. Read David Halberstam's The 50s. He'd wake those kids up in the middle of the night. One of them died freebasing cocaine. You know, Ozzie and Harriet was not perfect. And many of your families are not perfect. Not all of you are, have large numbers of poor kids. Some of you have middle class kids, even affluent kids. And some of them are in dysfunctional families. The truth is, you often are the person that makes them get up and move every day, that makes them want to go to school, that makes them want to learn, that makes them want to change the world. And what you teach academically and technologically is very important to me, but it's also important to me that you teach them optimism and that you give them a sense of purpose and you give them a chance to really learn and to feel powerful. Because at the end of the day, I, I've read a lot about resilience research. And uh, if you really want to break the cycle of violence, we've got to give these kids a why to live. You know where that comes from? When they asked Viktor Frankl how he survived the Holocaust, he quoted Nietzsche, who said, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. All of you have kids who come to school because of that class you teach. All of you have kids who may be too shy to say anything, but who you are helping to find their voice and giving them the reason to get up in the morning. The reality is that we have an opportunity here to make sure that our kids are in school and learning wonderful things. I came from a little town called Union City. I was on the school, I was on the uh, planning commission when the, I got to be on a school task force for um, the New Haven Unified School District. And what that, at that time, we really realized that the schools were very, they, the slogan of the district was equity, equality, stability. And the schools were inequitable, and they weren't equal, and they weren't stable, because it was a very fast-growing city. And so I chaired this committee, and, and uh, we decided that we would work to try to help the school district to work more with the city. So we actually started building schools on city parks, and we co-maintained them. And at some point, we split the cost of a police officer at James Logan High School. Now, you may think that's kind of thuggish, isn't it? But no, we, told a, we put a young officer at the high school and told him to focus on attendance, not on gang prevention, not on stopping fights necessarily, but focus on attendance. Well, guess what happens? It is much more significant when Officer Easton calls to say your child is not in school than when attendance clerk Easton calls and says your child's not in school. It had a big effect on attendance, and we've got a, uh, one of our colleagues here who was in New Haven at that time. You know what happened when attendance shot up? The income of the school district shot up. It made hundreds of thousands more dollars. We don't pay for excused absences in California. Not everybody understands that. And the kids that aren't in school are the ones that are breaking into your car and into your house. So guess what happened to daytime crime in Union City? It only dropped 33% the first year. The truth is that we wound up with a huge increase in graduation rates, a decline in teen pregnancy, and within five years, James Logan High School was a top 10 feeder for affirmative action to the University of California at Berkeley. So it really matters that we get kids to come to school and then that we engage them when they're at school. And that's what you're doing. You're engaging kids to learn things in different ways. And I'll just tell you, I, I, when Kamala Harris was running for district attorney in San Francisco, she and I went to lunch. I'd actually been on a jury. She was the prosecuting uh, attorney on, in Alameda County, and we wound up going to lunch. And she said, if I could do, is there anything a district attorney can do to help 
schools. I said, focus on attendance. And she did, and, and the San Francisco Unified benefited from it. And now we benefit because she fights for that in, uh, as the Attorney General of the State of California. I will just tell you that when Sheila Ahrens, a senior eval director of evaluation at McCrell Labs in Denver, Colorado, offered what she characterized as four steps toward fail-safe systems, she said, first, examine attendance and suspension policies and follow up on absences. That's consistent with my experience in Union City. And at one point in LA, they focused on this. They're not doing it as much right now. They need to. The reality is that um, San Francisco improved. Second, <clears throat> Sheila Aaron said, you need to find ways to keep students engaged and motivated while supporting their academic success. That's what you're doing. That's why you're here. <clears throat> Third, she said, we need to provide comprehensive support and attention to both academic and social and emotional nature. I, yes, thank you. These, these kids are all unique. They are not McDonald's Happy Meals. And they each have to be treated in a different way. And last, she said, we need a data dashboard that enables collection of reliable data in a systematic and intentional way to identify students who may be at risk, end quote. Archimedes was asked about a new tool he invented, a tool called the lever. He thought for a minute and he said, I'll tell you how powerful it is. You give me a fulcrum and a lever and a place to stand and I will move the world. That's what you're doing. That's what technology can do. It is your lever for some of these kids who won't get it otherwise. I believe in education and I hope you do too. But I will also tell you optimism is key. Martin Seligman points out that depressed people tend to be more re realistic than optimistic ones. He goes on to say the optimists, even when their optimism is unwarranted, accomplish more. In Seligman's words, the people most likely to succeed are those who combine, quote, reasonable talent with the ability to keep going in the face of defeat. Henry Ford is alleged to have said it somewhat differently. He said, if you think you can't, you're right. If you think you can, you're right, end quote. So I want to take a moment then just to say something about some true American heroes. I have had an epiphany. I used to think that, you know, heroes look like the people in the movies. The reality is we forget that sometimes our heroes are regular people who possess exceptional qualities in a given era. Oh, some are striking figures, but they, and they look like movie stars, but more often in my experience, they look like Abraham Lincoln and Harriet Tubman. They look like Susan B. Anthony and Harry Truman. They look like Mr. Rogers or Betty White or like Rob Reiner or Barbara Jordan. They look more like Cesar Chavez than Tom Hanks or Tom Cruise, and they look more like Dolores Huerta than Reese Witherspoon. Most of our heroes are intelligent people, but there are lots of intelligent people who have no courage to step up and do what needs to be done. Most of our heroes are insightful, but there are lots of insightful people who have no heart to fight for what needs to be done to save the children. And most of our heroes are perhaps unsure of what strategy needs to be followed for the success, but they just try and try again. One in 30 Americans is either in prison, on parole, or probation. The US has the highest incarceration rates for youth and adults in the world. Not only is it a waste of potential, but a great majority go back to jail. This is a trillion dollar waste, and for less than that, we could embody the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and invest more in education. So I will just tell you, I serve on the board of a charter school called Sciatech. It does drop out recovery. It works to help the kids that have been kicked to the curb that some charters don't want, but we, do in fact engage and involve these students, and they tend to really make a difference in the world. So I want to just say, if I could wish for anything, it is that our schools would fill up with optimism. We need people with talent and drive, yes, 
but we also need them to be optimistic to, to, and for that to be sustainable. Seligman said strong optimism, quote, strong optimism is an obvious virtue for high defeat and high stress jobs that require initiative, persistence, and bold dreaming. Just as obviously extreme pessimism is an asset to no one, end quote. Doesn't strong optimism seem like the work of teachers and principals? Doesn't it seem like the work of educators, com computer labs, and, and all manner of places should be celebrating optimism? He also goes on to say, quote, human beings require a context of meaning and hope. We used to have ample context when we encountered failure. We could pause and take our rest in that setting, our spiritual furniture, and revive our sense of who we are. I call the broader arena the commons, end quote. I would argue that the commons he is speaking about is really the common school, the place where our kids come and where they can have a sense of connectedness. And that's why overcoming the digital divide is essential, and your being here today is so important. Seligman said, quote, pessimism has a role to play both in society at large and in our own lives. We must have the courage to endure pessimism when its perspective is valuable. What we want is not blind optimism, optimism with eyes open. We must be able to use pessimism's keen sense of reality when we need it, but without having to dwell in its dark shadow, end quote. Sustainable change is possible in a positive, yes, can-do world. I want to also just give a shout out to Diane Ravitch, who says we have to move beyond old-fashioned testing. She says, to lift the quality of education, we must encourage schools to use measures of educational accomplishment that are appropriate to the subjects studied, such as research papers in history, essays and stories in literature, research projects in science, demonstrations of mathematical competence, videotaped or recorded conversations in a foreign language, performances in the arts, and other exhibitions of learning." End quote. That's why this emphasis on digital inclusion is so very important. So when we talk about the new basic skills, I want to just say this to all of you. Great civilizations inspire both great personal achievement and great social responsibility. Great civilizations arrive from the imagination and the work of people who are nurtured by societies to develop their gifts. In a word, education. Education is the place where personal and social responsibility come together for personal and social greatness, both together. And that's where you and I come in. In a great civilization, cities, counties, schools are institutional incubators of human potential. In every sense of the word, our job is to create institutional incubators of human potential. That's what you do in your classroom. And so while what gets measured is what gets done, it is in fact true that you don't fatten the hog by weighing it more often. And it is important that you work to give our kids a sense of their importance in this great world. In her book, Positivity, Barbara Fredrickson writes, I suspect you want to know what the latest science has to say about positivity, how it can improve your life. Positivity can, positivity can revitalize your worldview, your mental energy, your relationships, and your potential." End quote. That's from her book, Positivity, which I p highly recommend. So if you crave sustainable change in education, Please fully engage in this conference, and please take what you learn here and share it with your colleagues back home. And the reality is, go out of here after when you're done, I hope, with positivity, with optimism, with a sense of what we can do. In a world of amazing opportunities for those who have the educational tools that we have the ability to provide our kids, what we need to be sure is that these in entrepreneurial kids in the entrepreneurial state of California have a sense that we are keeping faith with our ancestors. Provide for the common defense. Promote the general welfare. Provide these blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. 
the only interest group important enough to be named in the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. So in the end, I will just tell you, I am proud to be standing here today with the computer using educators. I am standing shoulder to shoulder with you. I hope you will know that I came today because I needed a good shot of optimism and you give it to me. Thank you all very much. Stay optimistic. Thank you. That was awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much.